So while we prepare Hatsuki again, uh, I think maybe we can uh, have a small QA with uh, uh, one of the authors of uh, Hatsuki and uh, who is uh, Dr. Yaman. And uh, I would like to welcome him on, on our stage here or on our set. So uh, we can, maybe we can uh, discuss uh, some of the aspects of developing a uh, telepresence uh, system using Hatsuki or remote operation. So welcome, uh, Dr. Yaman. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I don't want to give myself much of a credit for this project. Um, I just joined uh, uh, while this project being prepared for publishing for uh, Kai. And we have worked together on the uh, ideation on what kind of uh, uh, scenarios Hatsuki and this kind of embodiment could be applicable for um, in uh, uh, Kai uh, in uh, CHI and uh, in uh, robotics uh, in general. Um, uh, yeah, overall, um, one of the exciting topics that I have uh, enjoyed about this work is um, the, the, the shift from virtual to physical. This way, um, we can have a lot of uh, attributes and factors that we can measure um, uh, in tangible matter. For example, um, uh, it's very common now uh, nowadays, especially in Japan, virtual YouTubers, which are uh, one medium for uh, you know, like uh, communicating with audiences, communicating with other p persons. However, um, uh, there is, uh, I, I feel there is some some sort of barrier still in even in virtual reality between um, the person and the actor who is behind the the character. Um, I feel like one one of these challenges that could be uh, evaluated and uh, tested is through like this physical embodiment this physical realization of uh, the avatars. And it comes, of course, into perspective or into one of the major factors is the design of this character. Mm -hmm. So actually, when I, I see it in from the video, it, she looks like um, a virtual character. But from physical perspective, when she's sitting next to me, um, it's possible to see the character um, in, front of my, uh, in front of my eyes. So uh, I would like to uh, I would like to ask you a simple question since uh, your domain is about telepresence and embodiment basically. So uh, what do you what do you foresee the cha the main challenges of embody uh, embodiment in terms of a humanoid robot like Hatsuki? Specifically, like Hatsuki is uh, unlike other robots, she has uh, specific design considerations to embody virtual characters. So how can uh, embodiment be advanced or progressed enough so that? Uh, uh, an operator or uh, like uh, a pilot, as they call it sometimes, uh, control Hatsuki and really bring the character to life in an in anime-like anime fashion. Mm. So, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, um, in most of the body of work that I have been uh, involved with, of course, it was more focused on the functionality as uh, um, tele-operated or tele, uh, in tele-existence scenario. So this requires like full immersion, um, a body mapping between the operator and the robot, and thus we had to design around these factors. You know, so for example, um, when we talk about the visual perception, we have to match um, uh, correct uh, visual latency, mechanical latency between the the motion of the user and the motion of the uh, the, the surrogate system. Um, of course, when it comes to uh, design-driven approach, which is like Hatsuki in this case. Hatsuki is uh, driven from uh, the visual design um, instead of the functional design. This is, I, like, of course, um, uh, this is one of the main motivations: is how can we uh, come up with uh, how can how, how can we come up with uh, functional character? Thus, of course, this will pose, uh, as you have been mentioning earlier, um, a lot of mechanical uh, limitations. Yeah. Yes. Um, but however, um, this is where it could be mitigated with, uh, I, I don't think it will become like a good way to use just um, a full immersion using head-mounted display um, to map the, the perception. This way we can use like uh, front displays. This way we can reduce the factors of uh, visual um, sickness and visual latency, uh, mechanical latency, and accommodate it to this uh, Use, uses actually um, there was like uh, in, in teleprocess research itself the use of displays instead of head mount displays is very common <laughs> so it still could be one factor um, to uh, to be used in this kind of scenarios yeah yeah, yeah. i 
Yes, thank you very much for your elaboration. Exactly, there are uh, a number of uh, research challenges to really bring uh, Husky, uh, to enable Husky to really perform when used with like a, a performer or for example using a, a voice actress to bring Husky to life through live performances. And it's, it's a complex challenge that involves uh, multiple factors as you mentioned. So I think we have some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, this is very interesting. You know, this is uh, just a back of the head projector, so we can basically uh, uh, employ any facial expression system or uh, f facial expressions that we want. Uh, we chose uh, this kind of expressions because they are consistent with the character that we envisioned first. We envisioned Husky to have a specific uh, attributes uh, and the characteristics, and to bring those to life, including you know, this facial expression system that matches the whole body design and aesthetics, and therefore also the voice, and therefore it builds the whole character. Of course, it's very easy to change the expressions, and we keep developing new and new expressions, and uh, we, we, ha we, we have uh, actually an illustrator in our team who, who is very good with this kind of designs, as he's constantly, constantly doing new impressions and facial expressions that we are experimenting with and using for both research as well as deployment. Now, developing Tintin style or like non-anime style expressions, of course, is possible, but that would mean probably building a new robot that matches this style. Of course, it's possible, but if we want to embody uh, an anime character, we have to be consistent. But as you said, yeah, I think it's possible. And I think it's an excellent comment because we haven't thought about rebuilding Hatsuki to embody cartoons from other cultures, I would say. For example, I don't know, like Tintin, for example, if we build a character that uh, embodies the design direction and the, char the characters of Tintin in a way that it, like the drawing style, so to bring those to life as a new robot, I think, I think it's very interesting. Because those, those expressions are also cartoonish. They, still, they lo look like anime-like. Like they are cartoonish so, and they are exaggerated to a degree, but it's a different art direction. Just to elaborate also on, on this part, um, it's, it's really like very interesting to, for like uh, artists to start um, experimenting. So, uh, for example, uh, the uh, the body itself um, it's modular, right? So, I, um, especially the 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 the, uh, the th aesthetic parts. So, it's possible, for example, to bring in new forms of uh, designs and start experimenting with this. This could be like really interesting topic for designers as a platform. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think, uh, you know, the purpose of exhibiting Husky at Kai is basically to inspire people to embrace this culture, the otaku culture or other cartoon cultures and entertainment applications. Uh, there are a lot of robotics research that focuses on industrial applications. So uh, we hope that by, d by demoing Husky and showing it in different communities, we hope that the Kai community would embrace this design direction and maybe embody the otaku culture in different ways and embrace it in human-computer interactions, because uh, I think there is a lot of potential for using the otaku culture in terms of interactions, because uh, this brings familiarity. For example, if, uh, what we have noticed is that when we deployed Hatsuki in Wanda Festival, uh, like uh, people who are slightly even familiar with the otaku culture would like this robot because they know what these expressions mean and they, they feel familiar with the robot. Uh, this is a ba like an initial insight, but basically this could probably mean a better, uh, like, uh, uh, I would say, uh, maybe a better, uh, uh, a better embodiment of a robot that does not induce a lot of uncanny valley, mm -hmm. because this robot is made to to look like a, a character. It's kind of cute. It's kawaii. It's not scary. It doesn't look like a human. So it's it's cartoonish to a, a huge degree. So this kind of characteristics are. I feel, based on basic insights, they are very important to, to embody in a, in a robot in order to reduce the uncanny valley. Of course, we have to do like in-depth studies to really understand the extent of this effect, but uh, uh, we, uh, like our basic results are very, very encouraging. There is another, another question. Maybe you can even take that one. I think this question is an embodiment question. You're better suited than me to answer it, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Ken. Um, so yes, um, uh, one of the 
the the key aspects of uh, the use of this kind of system. Actually, th this was something I, I feel it's related to something we were uh, discussing yesterday in one of the sessions about the immersion and uh, the the creativity. So. Um, it's uh, so far until now, like most of the mediums that we have been experimenting with were um, virtual, you know. So, for example, if you have some idea, we can uh, apply it into a virtual model and start interacting with it. We don't have um, the means for like evaluating it in a physical um, scenario, physical aspects. So, for example, how the AI will behave, uh, more like for example, in an imitating uh, uh, task. So, it's imitating to to handshake, imitating to um, uh, touch a person, to imitating to um, teach how to cook. So in probably in virtual uh, simulation, it gives like perfect and highly controlled scenarios. It can give like some kind of uh, visual aspects that are different when it comes to be realized in uh, a physical world, in the physical scenario. This way when we apply this model into a virtual character or like a physical character, if it was like enemy-like or um, just a robotic, this will give um, a better understanding of uh, the, the, the performance of the model that has been trained and deployed into the character. And also, of course, uh, since this one have uh, 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 emotional, uh, let's say, call, call it emotional or uh, a way to uh, show the facial expressions, this can give like way better um, uh, communication from when it's doing a task, it's performing a task, it can communicate with the person with, through expressions as well. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Yaman about this. And I think uh, uh, the, in terms of application domains, there are a lot of applications that we analyzed in our uh, previous full paper. And uh, it can fulfill both uh, service applications or entertainment applications. But uh, the key factor is that we really need to study Hotsky in depth to really see the acceptance of people, of, use, uh, of Hotsky to be used in different interactive contexts. For example, there are a lot of people who want to use Hotsky for industrial applications or, for example, to use Hotsky for house chores. Uh, maybe it's suitable, but you know, we have to look at it from a perspective of, uh, will this actually work? Would people really want a robot like Hatsuki to the house chores? Maybe and maybe not. We have to do further research to really understand the applications that then accordingly, uh, the AI and the machine learning techniques have to evolve further. Currently, the AI applications uh, that we have done, basically we employed MTRNN, and we report this in the Roman paper to uh, basically convey different uh, emotions and expressions in a lifelike manner because we want to avoid the robotic uh, repetitivity uh, when moving the arms and expressing yourself and saying different things. So one way is to use machine learning so that you convey the same expression in a slightly different way just like what humans do. So this is the, basically the first step into realizing a robot like Hatsky. And we reported the results like in details in our previous papers. Uh, if, you are, if you are interested, please uh, check them out. And uh, thank you very much. I hope this answers your question. OK, we have another question. Hmm, is it? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, this this kind of uh, <laughs> about how how uh, how to say how virtually realistic it is. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, currently, currently it's mainly driven for uh, by a, a user, a physical user. I feel like okay. So you know, like uh, Turing uh, Turing test, right? <laughs> Whether um, uh, the robot or a system is behaving as a human or as an artificial who is controlling the system itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so could be this one is the uh, next challenge is uh, who is actually inside the robot? Is it a real person or is it like fully driven by AI? Of course, this is again the, the very basic question for any AI system. Is it behaving autonomously or is it driven by a real person? Maybe also we can apply the same methodology or the same the same thing on uh, this kind of robotics. Yeah, I, I, 
I completely agree. I think it's, uh, it's very interesting on how can we blur the line. Because, you know, uh, we developed, for example, the performance that we broadcasted earlier, but we can also do the same performance. That performance was actually done by the voice actress, but we can do the same performance using machine learning. So maybe if we program the robot in a way that it behaves and somehow naturally, like what we did with MTRNN, so that it conveys the expressions in a natural way, in a different way, a lifelike manner. Uh, I don't know, maybe it will blur the line, actually. And uh, maybe it's kind of difficult for people to distinguish. Actually, we can, look, sorry. we can also look at it at, from a different perspective. So, so far, like when, uh, well, yeah, like when, it's when the person communicating with Hotsky, he would doesn't know that it's an actual person who's operating it. It's the other way around. It's actually operated by a person who's thinking that, okay, this is operated yeah. by AI, but actually, no, it's operated by yes. a real person. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, we can look at the, we can flip the coin and look at it from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I hope, I hope this answers your question. Uh, if you have any further comments or questions, please feel free to ask. All right, thank you very much, Yamin. <laughs> and we hope to see you in other events. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.